So let's open our Bibles again to our reading from Genesis chapter 9, starting now at verse 7, on this morning of 12th of February 2023, our first open in prayer. Lord, we pray for your loving hand upon us as we study your word. Give us the insight of the Holy Spirit and a pliable heart to believe, to see the depth of your love for us, and to act upon all that you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So on Sunday mornings we're going through Genesis and we're at the point where God is still speaking to Noah following his sacrifice after the flood. We last saw God's blessing on the increase of Noah's family on the earth, his gift of meat for food as well as plants, though not blood, and his demand for an accounting for all blood shed. In our present passage, there seem to be the following stages. First, a new beginning, verse 7. And second, God's covenant with the new world, verse 8 to 11. And third, the rainbow token, verse 12 to 17. So let's first look at a bit more on this new beginning, just verse 7 of Genesis 9. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. So the Lord continues by reaffirming the encouragement to be fruitful and increase in number, to multiply on the earth, to increase upon it. And this shows that at least the, the first half of Genesis 128a remains in force. When God blessed them, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He does not now tell Noah and his sons to subdue the earth and rule over its creatures. Instead, as an alternative wording, they're given into their hands, verse 2, which may be to do with eating meat, verse 3. But the rest of creation, that mandate, God renews. He grants mankind the whole earth to live on. Matthew Henry describes it as God's Magna Carta for man. He has the freedom to populate the world. We don't need population control. We need to fill the earth. But we also need to turn to God so that we handle it right. The earth belongs to us and to our heirs. Psalm 115, 16, the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So for Noah's descendants, including ourselves, this pattern of life would continue. Marrying, giving in marriage, begetting children. It's no longer a perfect paradise, but it is bearable, which is more than we deserve as sinners against God. It might be much better than it is if more submitted to Christ's rightful rule over them. It will be much worse for those who resist him to the end. But true to God's promise, man continues to fill the earth. Eight billion now and counting. And it's all the fulfillment of God's sovereign plan and purpose. Let me read to you Acts 17, 24. 26. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. So human beings were to continue to bear God's image, reflecting him and filling the earth with these reflections of God. That is the intention for the human race, to fill the earth with his divine glory. Well, what a mess we've made of that. But God's purposes still stand. As he has now set apart a new creation, a new humanity in Christ who will fill the new heaven and earth one day, just as Noah and his family would fill the then new earth. Uh, Colossians 1.10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what he wants for us, and that's what he wants from us. Are we making any progress towards those goals? Well, secondly, <coughs> God's covenant 
with the new world. Verse 8 to 11, we're in Genesis 9. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So God then begins a new thought from verse 8 as he speaks again to Noah and his sons with him to tell them of the establishment of his general covenant with this new world. In their hearing, he thereby establishes this covenant with them, verse 9, and with their seed after them. Now, is this the same covenant as that in chapter 6, verse 18 to 19, just before the flood, where he said, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Um, well, most likely it is the same one, um, but it has undergone some development now that the flood chapter is over. The part about entering the ark, obviously, um, has been fulfilled now. Uh, and consequently, God now gives some concrete unilateral decrees or promises, and these will extend to the entire future human race. This covenant is all of God, in spite of uh, his being morally superior and our infinite creditor. He graciously condescends to show man common grace and favor, allowing him to continue to live on the earth. The covenant handed down to the descendants of Noah's family, whom we all are. So even whether they obey or not, there will be this basic minimum standard of habitability of the earth. A covenant of God cannot be revoked, and it cannot be opted out of. We have nowhere else to live but the earth. It's worth mentioning that the, the new covenant in Jesus Christ also makes reference to the descendants of believers in Acts 2.39, for to you is the promise and to your children. And to all those afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. To Noah, literally, with your seeds, plural. Which is different from, but possibly anticipates, the covenant with Abraham, which was with him and his seed, singular, which Paul revealed stood for Christ. But the scope of the covenant made with Noah includes not only human beings, but these new promises will apply also to every living creature that was on the earth with them. Verse 10, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast, all those that came out of the ark with them, every beast of the earth going forward in future generations, they too have the right to live and roam upon it. So the intention of this covenant is to protect and preserve life on earth, in particular human life, but in fact all life, the whole creation. But so what is this covenant which must remain in place to this day? It is, verse 11, that never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood, that never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now this is a very specific promise, but it has held good ever since. And it still holds. There have been floods, but never global ones. There have been deaths and extinctions, but never of all life. There is still life around. There may be devastating earthquakes in Turkey and Syria now, for which we hold out our hearts, of course, for those affected. We pray for their relief. But even these are very localized. They're not happening everywhere at once. Atlantis may have sunk below the waves if it ever existed, but not Europe, Asia, America, Africa, all at once. God's word is true. And his promises are sure. Even though this post-flood world would rapidly gain on the pre-flood world for violence and immorality. We may have beheld the occasional tsunami or volcano, but we are so far from being wiped out that all should just fall down in thanksgiving for the mercy of God, just that we are alive at all. He should receive all the glory for the, his wise and kind governance of the world in spite of our active 
rebellion against him. It's a continuing mercy of God. It's more than we deserve. The Lord gives humanity a solemn assurance that there will never again be such a cursing of the ground that it be flooded to the destruction of all life, including the human race. All this in spite of the, the state of man's heart still that we read in 8 verse 21. Um, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Uh, and it was, you could say, it's just as bad as it was before the flood. Because again, God said, he saw how man's wickedness, 6 verse 5, on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And so the flood had to come, but after the flood, we're just as bad. What good did that do to us? Well, we've got this promise. We've got this assurance that he won't do that again. So this promise is established irrespective of the fallenness or the sinfulness of man. Though that sin is taken no less seriously, we are encountering the grace of God. And the same is true of what that covenant points to, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We mustn't forget that this passage follows Noah's sacrifice, an offering pleasing, sweet-smelling, propitiatory. We see the justice of God in the fossil record, all those creatures buried, dead, in the flood. And we see the mercy of God in that such a flood has never been since. In Isaiah 54, 9-10, we read, For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Can you see there that God went even further than that in his grace and mercy when he sent his son to the cross to personally pay for our sins so that we might not just live and die and go to a deserved hell but live forever with him in glory even if we would simply trust in his name in his finished work his sacrifice of the cross behind all grace to us from God there lies the propitiatory sacrifice of his own son in our stead. The Pascal Lamb has already been predetermined to take away the sin of the world. This old covenant points forward to the new and it has a sign. Thirdly, the rainbow token, verse 12 to 17 of Genesis 9. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. So as a token of this covenant with the new world, God gives a visible sign. Verse 12, the sign of a marriage covenant is a couple of matching rings. I've got mine. Don't worry about Sunnis. They mean that we fully intend never to break our marriage vows. God was serious enough about his, this covenant to place this lasting signature of his on it, betokening a new promise between him and Noah and his sons and every living creature that was with him for perpetual generations. And we read in Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath in this case as an assurance that 
he will indeed make good the promise just stated never again to flood the whole earth or kill off all life. That sign is the rainbow, verse 13, which God set in the cloud as a token of the covenant between the Lord God and the earth. He calls it his bow. Now, old Matthew Paul describes this bow as God's pledge and the seal of his promise, which it is, only it's not like the kind of bow you tie up a parcel with. The Hebrew word means a bow in the archery sense. It symbolizes the weapon God used to wipe out all life from the earth. Now decommissioned, laid aside, hung up in the clouds as a sign that he won't be using it again on the earth. The rainbow, a decommissioned weapon of mass destruction. That's what it is, or at least what it symbolizes. After the battle, now peace. Heaven and earth reconciled. A prefiguration of God and sinners reconciled now in Christ. The rainbow we see appears when sunlight is broken up by refraction through water droplets. Was it seen before the flood? Maybe not, as the bow itself would have still been firmly in God's hand with the string bent back. But in the post-flood world, his thunderbolts and his arrows of rain would never again annihilate the population, leaving Noah and his family free to multiply and <coughs> fill the earth. It was a great reassurance for them, I'm sure. That is the promise of this particular covenant, that when God brings clouds over the earth, verse 14, he'll see his own bow in them up there laid up beyond use. He could easily put that bow back into use, but his own sign, his commitment to his own covenant, prevents him. Now, we don't always see rainbows when it rains, but we see them often enough to remind us of his promise, at least if we haven't been distracted by other uses of the rainbow sign by sinful man who eschews the knowledge of God in unrighteousness. Forget about that. Be careful to teach your children the true meaning of the rainbow, so that they learn a healthy fear of God and a healthy horror of sin. Don't let his enemies steal the narrative. The rainbow serves as the token or the pledge of God's covenant and is possibly a, a foretaste or first fruits of that emerald rainbow that exists around the throne of heaven. Revelation 4.3 and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. God remembers his covenant, verse 15, and therefore his promises can never fail. The waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, because his covenant here is with all flesh. We need this reminder of God's mercy and of our sinfulness that deserves no such promise. God is gracious to us. And God is not forgetful. He does not need to remind himself of his own commitments, verse 16. It, it's really for our benefit, isn't it? When we look upon his bow in the clouds, we should remember that it is the sign of this everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. It's our consolation of hope that we need not fear total extermination from the earth, from any rain or flood or deluge. And additionally, Christians can also take it to mean that where sin abounded, God's mercy abounded even more. Romans 5.20, moreover the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And that doesn't just apply to our relative safety upon the earth, but to the eternal security of the new covenant the eternal life that we have in Christ, thanks to God's mercy towards us. Of that too, it is we who are forgetful and need to keep being reminded. But God speaks after the manner of men, so that we may grasp as much as we need to of things otherwise too high and lofty for us. So God concludes his speech to Noah by reaffirming that this, the rainbow, is the sign of of the covenant, verse 17, which he had now established between himself and all flesh upon the earth. God likes to repeat himself. He repeats things in his word so that we better 
Remember them. And if we take the trouble to commit these things to memory, we will be strengthened in our faith. Noah and his family may have been fearful in case another calamity was just round the corner hitting the earth. But to counter that, God gives them a visible sign and bids them remember its meaning. And if we want the same assurance, if we want the same joy, commitment, quality of life in our walk with God, then memorization of scripture is a needful occupation. Learn it and have it internalized so that you don't need to go and look for that passage. You've got it in your head. You know God's promises to you. We've noted earlier that in the Bible very often one covenant is meant to remind us of another by pointing to it. And in Noah's future, but our past, has been established a new covenant wherein God's appointed servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, has undertaken to redeem his people. Isaiah 42, 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Like Noah and his family, we do not receive the wrath we deserve. We don't receive the full wages of sin. And we're not complaining about that. We're not going through the street with placards, where's my wages? We're happy that God doesn't give us our full wages of sin. Christ appears in glory with a rainbow around his head. Revelations 10, 1. I saw a mighty angel coming down out of the sky, clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. Uh, many identify that figure with Christ. I think that's sensible. He is Lord and he's also mediator of a better covenant. He will definitely not drown the world and he will definitely save all his people, all who trust in him. When the world does end, it will be in fire, not water. And then there'll be a separation of souls and then God's bow will be taken up again to destroy his enemies. Psalm 7, 12 to 13, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Make sure you won't be on the receiving end of his arrows of wrath. Make sure you turn to Jesus, the Savior, in whom there is mercy and forgiveness forevermore before he must become your judge. For now, when we see a rainbow, usually it's, it's bent upwards, away from the earth. In certain conditions, you might see a complete circle or other patterns which are perhaps not so relevant, but some say, if you see one upside down, then watch out. That might be a sign that Christ is returning, bow in hand, to judge the earth. Not with water, but with fire, maybe. We don't insist on that as a sign of his return, but all must be warned to repent before it's too late. We do not know the day or the hour, but we do know our Lord who said, Matthew 24, 30 to 31, at that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So for those on his side, there shall be no terror, even then, but only delight and thankfulness in their Redeemer, and the prospect of a blessed eternity. What a mighty and merciful God we do have. Let's come to him now in prayer. Father, we thank you for those promises of protection from a flood like that of Noah's day. Yet still we realize we deserve no such protection. And so we flee to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, from the sinful world that we inhabit, from our own works, whether good or bad. Lord, only you can make us clean and give us the guarantees we need to be sure of escaping the horrors of your wrath to come. We thank you that you are just, but also merciful that you sent your son to live a perfect life for us and then to die the death that we really deserved. Accept us, forgive us, we pray in his name alone. May his atoning blood wash us, cleanse us from all impurity that we might appear before you justified. Help us to lean on 
the Lord Jesus and no other, claiming salvation by his works, his righteousness alone, and his sacrifice for sin. And sanctify us, we pray. Spare our nation, if that be your will, but souls are more precious. Grant them repentance, Lord, that they might be saved. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.